Today we're starting Unit 3 on cells. It's looking here, this is the inside of a cell. Looking at that center structure, that's going to be your nucleus, and notice the membranous system that's around that nucleus. That's actually going to be the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and then you'll have some smooth endoplasmic reticulum around it. So starting off, all organisms are going to be made up of cells. To get to know the basic concept, cells are going to be the smallest unit of life that can function independently and perform all necessary functions of life, including reproducing themselves. Here's an example of different things that are made up of cells. Organisms can be unicellular, which means made up of one cell, or they can be multicellular, which you see in all of these organisms here. So you have a mushroom, you have a lemur, and you have the head louse. All of these different things, even though they're made up of many cells, some of them you're able to see with your naked eye, and then some actually require microscopes in order to see them, depending on which organism you're looking at. Cells were first discovered by Robert Hooke. He was a British scientist in the mid-1600s. or mid A cell is going to be a three-dimensional structure, like a fluid-filled balloon, in which many of the essential chemical reactions of life will take place. Now, when he first noticed the cell, he was looking at a piece of cork. When he looked at that cork underneath a crude microscope, he noticed that it looked like an empty kind of blank space or blank box. He thought that they reminded him of the rooms that monks stayed in in a monastery, which are referred to as cells. So that's how the cell got its name. It was named after the rooms that monks stay in. So nearly all cells are going to contain DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid. We say nearly all cells because some cells start off with a nucleus with DNA in it, and then they eject that nucleus and then no longer contain DNA in the cell as they perform their job. An example of that would be a red blood cell. When it first forms, it does form with a nucleus, but then it gets rid of that nucleus before it becomes a mature functioning red blood cell. The largest cell that you're going to be able to see is going to be an egg. And so sometimes those eggs, if let's say it's a human egg, for example, it could be as small as a pinprick or a top of a pin. If it's an ostrich egg, it could be carried around in a wheelbarrow. Cell theory is going to be an important theory that was created that describes all living things. So first off, all living organisms are going to be made up of one or more cells. Like we said, if it's one cell, it's considered to be unicellular. If it's more than one cell, it is called a multicellular organism. Us, as humans, we are made up of trillions of cells, so we are considered to be multicellular organisms. Number two, all cells arrive from other pre-existing cells. So even with human organisms or any organism that you put together, lots of time you put a sperm and an egg together if it's going to be sexual reproduction, and those come from pre-existing cells, and they create a new organism. If it is a organism that's unicellular itself, it simply goes through a process known as binary fission in order to create a new organism. So all cells arise from pre-existing cells. So looking here, that simply shows you the different types of cells that these organisms come from. Most of the time, if you are growing, repairing tissue, or just replacing old worn out cells, you're gonna take the parent cell that you see at the top right, and it's going to go through a process known as mitosis and divide into two daughter cells. And so therefore that one pre-existing cell makes two daughter cells. Looking here, you see those ostrich eggs that this kid's carrying around in a wheelbarrow. They could be up to three pounds each. Another one that we can look at as cells that you can actually see would be like beluga sturgeon eggs. These are about $700 an ounce. So this is your expensive caviar that you hear people talking about. And then you're going to have a human egg here that's microscopic, so you're not going to be able to see that with the human eye. So in summary, the most basic unit of any organism is the cell. It's the smallest unit of life, and you need to know that, smallest unit of life, that can function independently and perform all the necessary functions of life, including reproducing itself. All living organisms are going to be made up of one or more cells, and all cells arise from pre-existing cells. Prokaryotic cells are structurally simple, but extremely diverse. 
So with pro, that means before, and then karyote is going to be the nu nucleus that we talk about. So this is before the nucleus. So every cell on Earth falls into one of two basic categories. You have the eukaryotic cell. This is with the nucleus. And you have the prokaryotic cell, which does not contain the nucleus. With the eukaryotic cell, this is going to be examples of humans and animals and plants. These are going to have a central control center called the nucleus. And inside that nucleus, you're going to find your DNA. During its normal form, it's found as chromatin. And right before it starts to divide, it um, condenses and makes chromosomes. We refer to these organisms as eukaryotes. The next type is going to be a prokaryotic cell. This does not have a nucleus. Its DNA simply resides in the middle of the cell. Lots of times it is not going to be a linear form of DNA. Instead, with a prokaryote, it is going to be a circular form of DNA. So you find its chromosomes in circle pattern, not strings, not linear. And we refer to these organisms as prokaryotes. Now with the prokaryotic structure, we also say that prokaryotes do not have organelles. Organelles are going to be little packages of um, machinery that work within that cell to perform a specific job. For example, we have the mitochondria that works on making energy and ATP. But looking inside the eukaryote, they're not going to have any membrane bound organelles except for one. There is an exception. You're going to have the ribosome. And that's what you see inside there that has all the little dots throughout. And ribosomes are going to be very important because they're able to take that genetic information and make it into protein structures and perform different functions that that cell might need. So all prokaryotes, let's start from the top on the left hand side, are going to contain a plasma membrane. So that's going to be a simple cell membrane that goes around it. It's going to have cytoplasm inside. That is going to be the fluid-like matrix that everything floats in. It does have DNA. Now, it can have two different types of DNA, but notice that these chromosomes or this DNA is going to be in a circular form. You have to know that, circular form. The regular DNA is going to be the larger one that you see there. And so this is the regular DNA strand or chromosome. Then you can have extra chromosomes, which contain anywhere from like four to seven genes usually. And that's going to be these smaller pieces. So these smaller pieces of circular DNA are referred to as plasmids. These are going to be different genes that these prokaryotes can exchange with each other. So they can get close to each other, connect using these pili that you see right here, and connect to each other, and they can transfer these plasmids back and forth. And so that can kind of change their genetic diversity up some. So they're not all going to be exactly the same. Coming over to the right hand side, you see additional structures. They do have cell walls. It helps protect and give shape. They have a capsule around it. That's another protective outer coating. You see the pili there. They're going to be hair like projections that help a cell attach to other surfaces and sometimes plays a role, like we said, in DNA transfer. And sometimes you'll find a flagellum on them. That's going to be a whip like projection that aids in cellular movement. So it helps that cell get around. So which component of a prokaryotic cell would not be considered intracellular? Now, intra, you need to know, means inside, and then you have cellular, which is the cell. So which one is not inside the cell? If you chose the flagellum, you are correct. That's what you find outside of the cell. So in summary, every cell on Earth is either a eukaryotic or a prokaryotic cell. Prokaryotes, which have no nucleus, were the first cells on Earth. So these appeared very early on in life. They're also single-celled organisms. Prokaryotes include things like bacteria, archaea, and as a group are characterized by tremendous metabolic diversity. So depending on what type of prokaryote you're talking about depends on what they're going to actually use for energy. That's what they mean by metabolic diversity. Eukaryotic cells are going to have compartments with specialized functions. With these compartments, we refer to them as organelles. So looking inside here, eukaryotic cells have these organelles. We have with the eukaryotic cell here, the DNA contained in the nucleus. 
You're going to have internal structures organized into compartments. They're larger than prokaryotes. If you put them together, this one you're seeing on the left-hand side is 6,000 times its normal size, whereas on the right-hand side, you see that this bacteria here is going to be 10,000 times its normal size. With a eukaryote, you can see it under a microscope fairly easily, depending on what type of cell you're looking at and structure. With a prokaryote, you can see it under a microscope, but lots of times you'll use the 100 times power along with the 10 times eyepiece, which makes it a thousand times its size, and then it still looks very, very small. Now that's referred to as the oil immersion lens and does require oil to help you see those things at a thousand times their normal size. Also with the eukaryote, you have cytoplasm that contains special structures called organelles. So all the organelles are floating around in that matrix inside of the cell. Coming on over to the right hand side, with your prokaryotic cells, you're not going to have a nucleus. Remember that DNA is going to be floating around in a circular form inside of the cytoplasm. Internal structures are not organized into compartments, and they're going to be much smaller. But remember, they do have one organelle. They do have the ribosome, which helps make proteins. It's very important to remember. So coming on over into the eukaryotic cells, lots of times we like to put them into either plant or animal cells. And comparing them, lots of times they do share some of the same structures, but then they'll have some different structures. So looking at these, notice how, go to this, they both have a nucleus in the center. Nucleus looks fairly the same. It's where you're going to find um, the chromosomes inside. And then you see that nucleolus, which is going to be the circle inside the nucleus there for both of those. With that nucleolus, those are responsible for making ribosomes, which then they send out through these nuclear pores here that you see into the cytoplasm. You have a plasma membrane on both. You have ribosomes for both. You have the mitochondria, and we'll get into the structures of each of these, what each structure does. You have the rough endoplasmic reticulum. You have smooth endoplasmic reticulum in both. Cytoplasm, cytoskeleton, the Golgi apparatus, and lysosomes. Now, one structure that only is found in animal cells here is going to be the centriole. The centriole is going to be responsible for helping that cell divide during mitosis and meiosis. Over on the right-hand side, structures that you'll only find in plants will be the chloroplast, which is going to be responsible for helping with photosynthesis, the cell wall, which helps make that plant rigid and keep its shape, help it from drying out, or help keep it from drying out, and a large central vacuole, which is usually used for water. Now you do find vacuoles in animals, but with plants, lots of times they're gonna have a larger central vacuole. Sometimes it's even larger than the nucleus and it will fill with water because remember plants can't go get a glass of water whenever they're thirsty. They're gonna to have to be able to absorb that water, keep that water in a container and use it throughout its day. Endosymbiosis theory is going to be a theory that was developed to explain the presence of two organelles in eukaryotes. It helps explain the chloroplast and the mitochondria. These two organelles are going to be different from any other organelle within these cells. They contain their own DNA. And so scientists were wondering, how do they have different DNA from the nucleus of the plant that all the other organelles would contain? So humans, deep down, may be part bacteria. You ask, how could this be? Well, humans aren't going to have the chloroplast, but we will have the mitochondria. That mitochondria has different DNA inside of it than you have inside of your nucleus. So it is thought that a long time ago, the mitochondria was absorbed by the cell. So you have your ancestry prokaryote. That is your starter cell. This little bacteria right here came close to the side, pushed into the side of that cell membrane, and eventually was pulled in and became part of that cell. It changed over, became that mitochondria. They worked together in a symbiotic relationship, and it still retained its own DNA, though. Now, fun fact about mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA comes from your mother, so it matches your mother's DNA. If you have brothers and sisters, they could have different fathers, but if you have the same mother, you will have the same mitochondrial DNA. Now looking over 
at a, another theory is going to be the invagination theory. And this is how they think that the nucleus formed and how they think that other um, membrane bound structures were formed inside of the cell. So you start out with your ancestry eukaryote. You have your DNA, which is a linear form floating around in the cytoplasm. Over time, the cell membrane starts to fold in on itself. It creates a nice membrane bound organelle where it encloses the DNA. And then it also creates membrane bound structures around that nucleus. And those become things like the rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So which can be found in both prokaryote and eukaryote cells? If you answered the ribosome, you are correct. So eukaryotes are going to be single-celled or multicellular organisms whose cells have a nucleus that contains linear strands of genetic material. Linear means it's going to be straight lines or single strands. The cells also commonly have organelles throughout their cytoplasm, which may have originated evolutionarily through endosymbiosis or invagination or maybe even both. The cell membrane is going to be referred to as the gatekeeper of the cell. So looking here, we see the gatekeepers that are going to be standing outside of this building. And so the cell membrane is kind of going to work the same way. They determine what goes in and what comes out. So looking here at the plasma membrane, that's the same thing as the cell membrane. You're going to see that it's going to be two layers filled with very, a variety of different pores, molecules, and channels. So we refer to it as a phospholipid bilayer because it has two layers there. Its job is to hold contents of the cell in place. It takes in food and nutrients. It's going to help aid in building and exporting molecules and allows interactions with the environment and neighboring cells. So why are the plasma membranes such complex structures? It's going to be because they perform several critical functions. Well, taking in food and nutrients is going to be very important. Some things can come directly across the cell membrane, where other things actually have to be pulled in. Also, it's going to depend on what it's made of. If it's a lipid-based um, substance, it can come directly across through diffusion. If it's a large molecule or it is hydrophilic, it's going to actually require some help to come through. So sometimes they'll come through things like protein channels, and sometimes it will come through and be um, surrounded by a membrane and created a ves uh, like a vesicle. They're also responsible for disposing of waste products. They build and export molecules. They're going to help regulate heat exchange and regulate flow of materials in and out of the cell. So first, starting off with the structure of a plasma membrane or a cell membrane, it's made up of structures called a phospholipid. It's going to have a hydro hydrophilic head, which means it's water loving. That head is going to be a phospho or a phosphate. It's going to be attached to hydrophobic tails, which are going to be your lipid tails. And of course, they do not like water. So notice with a phospholipid membrane bilayer, you're going to see the phosphate heads facing towards the outside of the cell because that extracellular fluid is going to be made up of water. Remember, they love water. They're hydrophilic. And of course, they face the inside of the cell, which is also going to contain water within the cytoplasm. So the parts that love water face the watery environments. Inside, you're going to have those hydrophilic tails or hydrophobic tails. Sorry. Those are the ones that do not like water. And so they stay facing each other so they don't come in contact with water. Now, if they were to come in contact with water, let me draw to here, instead of the tails hanging down nice and straight the way they are, they will kind of go up towards the top and try to get away from that water. And so that's what they would look like if for some reason water got into that middle part of that membrane. Every cell of a living organism is going to be enclosed by a plasma membrane, a two-layer membrane that holds the contents of a cell in place and regulate what enters and leaves that cell. Molecules are going to be embedded within this plasma membrane and it's going to help it perform its function. So looking here, we're looking at a phospholipid bilayer. You notice there's two layers of those phospholipids. 
one layer here, one layer here. You see those are the phosphate heads and the lipid tails in between. You're going to have actual cholesterols or lipids embedded within. That's going to be important because they're going to help it if it becomes um, very cold. They help keep that cell membrane fluid and moving. You'll also see transmembrane proteins. These are proteins that go throughout. And so they're going to have a hydrophilic section. And then they have that hydrophobic section through the center. You'll also see what's referred to as glycoproteins. So they're going to be proteins that are embedded within that contain glycogen or carbohydrates on the outside. Lots of times these are going to be there for recognition. So if a white blood cell were to come by and it sees the structure, it checks it, sees that this is a cell that belongs inside the body, and so it will bypass it and not attack it. Now if it has these glycoproteins that do not match up with that body cells, let's say in terms of a organ transplant, for example, you would actually mark the cell for target and then destroy it. So what determines whether proteins reside on the surface or extend through the bilayer? Well, looking at that, it's going to depend on the different types of proteins that are going to be there. If it has those carbohydrates in the end, they want to extend to the outsides. They work with recognition. If it's a transmembrane protein, it's going to have the hydrophobic part, which is going to go through the center. So that makes the other two ends, which are hydrophilic, orient themselves so they face the watery part. And so this is simply going to refer to its tertiary structure and how they're built. So remember when we went over how these things were put together? If we made the primary strand, that was simply making the amino acid strand. When we went into the secondary strand, that was how they zigzagged or corkscrewed. And then the tertiary structures, how they bend. Now, parts of those proteins might be hydrophobic, part of them might be hydrophilic, and that's going to cause them to create their shape. And so that tertiary structure, how it creates its shape, what parts of it are going to be hydrophobic, like this, will orient themselves towards the middle. And the parts that are hydrophilic, like the ends, will orient themselves towards the watery environment. And that happens in the tertiary structure. So looking through these, we're going to have four primary types of membrane proteins, and each are going to perform different types of functions. You have what's referred to as receptor proteins. That's going to be the first one that we see. Oop, hold on. The first one that we see on this end here. It's going to help bind to external chemicals in order to regulate processes within the cell. So this could happen for anything that needs to come inside the cell or anything that needs to happen. Let's say that you're in a stressful situation. It can be adrenaline that's binding there. This is going to help you um, speed up your fight or flight response. You have what's referred to as recognition proteins. So those will be proteins like this here, which are specifically there for recognition. But also you have recognition particles attached to the protein here. And that's referred to as a glycoprotein. And so those are going to function as a cell fingerprint. The third type is going to be your transport proteins. These are here to help bring things that, across that membrane into the cell that can't come into the membrane normally, directly through that cell membrane. They actually have to have something to help them. And so they're going to act like little tunnels or little channels that bring these things in. And then the fourth type are going to be membrane enzymes. These actually accelerate intracellular and extracellular reactions on the plasma membrane. So in addition to proteins, two other molecules are going to be found on the plasma membrane. We have short branched carbohydrate chains, which I've showed you. These are your glycoproteins. And we said that serves as part of the membrane's fingerprint, along with recognition proteins. So that lets the body know, or the white blood cells know, that, hey, that cell belongs in the body, not to destroy it. If you bring in cells that do not have the correct fingerprint on them, the body will mark them for destruction, even if they are saving your life and it will attack them. The second is going to be the cholesterols that we saw embedded within that cell membrane. It's going to help maintain the flexibility and prevents the membrane from becoming too fluid or too floppy as it acts as kind of like an antifreeze. Now, if it gets too hot, it could cause that cell membrane to become rigid. So which arrow indicates a protein or part of a protein that's going to be hydrophobic, does not like water. 
If you chose C, that is correct. That's going to be the section here that goes straight through the center that you'll find with the phospholipid tails. Which plasma membrane component helps cells communicate with one another? Right. The plasma membrane is going to be a fluid mosaic of proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates. Proteins found in the plasma membrane are going to enable it to carry out most of its gatekeeping functions. The proteins act as receptors, they help molecules enter and leave the cell, and they catalyze reactions on the inner and outer surfaces. In conjunction with carbohydrates, some plasma proteins are going to be there for identification with other cells. And in addition to the phospholipids that make up most of the plasma membrane, you're going to find cholesterols that are going to be important lipids in some of the membranes, and they're going to influence the fluidity. Now, sometimes you will have faulty membranes that are going to be produced, and these can cause disease. So looking here, we have cystic fibrosis. That's going to be caused by a malfunctioning cell membrane. It can create thick and sticky mucus produced by someone with cystic fibrosis. It's going to collect in the lungs there. And so you see the first picture. They're doing a process called thumping on the chest to help loosen up mucus. And in the next picture, they're showing this vest, which will inflate and help um, move that mucus around. It has a similar effect, and it goes usually through a course of a 20-minute session. If you allow that mucus to build up in the lungs, Bacteria can then form, and it could cause things like pneumonia. So with cystic fibrosis, it occurs when an individual inherits from both parents an incorrect genetic instruction for producing one type of transmembrane protein. This protein occurs primarily in the membranes of cells found in the lungs and the digestive tract. When functioning normally, the protein serves as a passageway that allows one type of molecule, which are chloride, chloride ions, to get into and out of the cell. Why do beta blockers reduce anxiety? Well, looking at the cell membrane, we talked about the um, receptor cells and how they actually lock on to a particle. This one, we talked about adrenaline. It's going to have a beta receptor on the outside of the cell membrane on the kidneys here, and the adrenal glands are going to produce adrenaline. So in a stressful situation, the adrenal glands pump out adrenaline. Then the adrenaline is going to bind with beta receptors on cells that cause a faster heartbeat and increase blood pressure. Now in order to work, it has to fit perfectly, and usually what you see here is acting as a lock and key system. And so the adrenaline comes in and binds and causes that reaction. With medications that they figured out how to create, a beta blocker, for example, here is going to be the same shape, comes into that receptor, binds to it, and blocks it. So this adrenaline here can't come in and cause that anxiety. So it reduces anxiety by blocking the amount of adrenaline that is being picked up by those receptors. So normal cell function can be disrupted when cell membranes, particularly the proteins embedded within them, do not function properly. Such malfunctions can cause health problems such as cystic fibrosis, but disruptions can also have beneficial therapeutic effects such as treatments for high blood pressure and anxiety. Membrane surfaces are going to have a fingerprint that identifies the cell. So cells with an improper fingerprint are going to be recognized as foreign, and they're going to be attacked by your body's defenses. So the white blood cells will mark them and then attack them. What happens when a patient receives an organ with different molecular fingerprints from his or her own cell? Well, that patient's body would attack it and destroy that organ, even though the organ is keeping them alive. So it's going to be important that after they receive that organ transplant, they're going to have to take um, immune system, sorry, these are going to be immunosuppressant drugs which go in and they suppress your immune system. So your immune system does not destroy the organ or whatever structure you have in there, saving your life. So with these, we're going to have, let's say, a donor liver transferred into this person who needs the transplant.
And so their molecular structure on their liver or on their cells is going to be the teal that you see up here. Sorry, let me go back. So it is going to be this type. Well, their donor liver, let's say, has this type of fingerprint. So when it's put in, it is actually going to reject this liver and actually start to destroy it, even though it would save the person's life. So that person would then have to take a specific type of drug, which is going to help keep that um, immune system suppressed so it can't go out and attack the organ that's saving their life. And so with that, you are going to have to watch what you're around, who you're around, things like that. You're going to have to be very careful because if someone is sick, you're going to be able to catch that illness very easily and your immune system is suppressed, so therefore you're not going to be able to fight it as well. So you have to be extremely careful with your health if you take the immunosuppressant drugs. So why is it extremely unlikely that a person will catch HIV from casual contact, such as handshaking or hugs or even sitting on the toilet? It's going to be because of these cell membranes. So plasma membranes of a cell deep within the body are going to have a specific marker. It's referred to as a CD4 marker. And so with this CD4 marker, it's going to act, like we said, like a lock and key system like most do. And it's going to have to actually fit into this marker in order to be brought into that cell to infect the cell. Now some cells, such as cells on the skin, notice, don't have the CD4 marker. So you could get HIV somehow on the outside of the skin, but without that marker, it cannot bring it into the body or infect the cells. So therefore, casual contact is not going to be dangerous. Now, if for some reason you have a break in the skin, a cut, an opening, a wound, and that person somehow got HIV infected cells on the body, they could go in through that cut or wound and they could infect cells inside that do have that CD4 marker and it could cause infection. But casual contact is very unlikely. So in summary, every cell in your body has a fingerprint made from a variety of molecules on the outside facing surface of the cell membrane. This molecular fingerprint is going to be key to the function of your immune system. So looking here, we see a number of cells. These cells are going to rely on getting things in and out of them in order to survive. One type of transport, as we call it, is going to be passive transport. And this is going to be done through spontaneous diffusion of molecules across the membrane. And there's going to be two types of passive transport. When it's passive transport, it means it does not require ATP or the energy molecule. No energy is required. And so we're going to have simple diffusion and osmosis. Diffusion is going to be a passive transport in which a particle called a solute is dissolved into a gas or liquid called a solvent, and it moves from one area of high solute concentration to an area of lower concentration. So it goes from a high to a low until they become equal or evenly distributed. When talking about cells, diffusion usually refers to the situation in which the solutes move across a membrane. So looking here, you can see how they're dropping a drop of dye or food coloring into water, and you see how it moves throughout. So it's going from an area of high concentration, which is where that drop first went in, and it's going to diffuse across until it's evenly distributed. So the solutes is what's being dissolved. In this case, it would be the food coloring. And the solvent is what's doing the dissolving. So that's going to be the water in this case. Simple diffusion allows things to come directly across the membrane. So things such as uh, oxygen coming in and carbon dioxide going out. Facilitated diffusion is going to be where molecules move across the plasma membrane with the help of a channel or carrier molecule. And so these are going to be things that are too big or aren't able to come across that membrane without help. So they have this protein here. Facilitated diffusion in most molecules, which can't move across the plasma membrane on their own, do require these. So these are going to be proteins. Defects in these transport proteins can reduce or even bring facilitation diffusion or facilitated diffusion to a complete stop. And this will cause serious health consequences or diseases. Many of these are going to be genetic diseases or because your body created the wrong protein, somehow maybe it misspelled it, 
That would be a genetic mutation. And because of this, it causes problems within the cell. They can't perform their proper functions. And so we see things like cystinuria and kidney stones. For proper functioning, cells must acquire food molecules and other necessary materials from outside of the cell. So they come in through diffusion. Similarly, metabolic waste and molecules must leave that cell and go elsewhere to be um, disposed of. And so these will leave the cell through diffusion. In passive transport, which includes simple and facilitated diffusion and osmosis, the molecule movement occurs spontaneously without input of energy. So it comes directly across the membrane. If it can't, it will use that transport protein to bring it in or out. This generally takes place as molecules move down their concentration gradient. So they'll move from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration. Osmosis is gonna be the second type of simple diffusion or passive diffusion. And osmosis is only gonna be the diffusion of water across the membrane. So you have to know that osmosis is water diffusion. And so it's a type of passive transport by which water diffuses across the membrane in order to equalize the concentrations of water inside and outside of the cell. So they both want to be equal and the same. It's going to be determined by the total amount of solutes on either side of the cell membrane. If it's an isotonic cell, that's going to be the cell that's equal both inside and out. So it's equal. It's balanced. If it's hypotonic solutions, that's where the solutes are going to rush into the cell, and it's actually going to cause that cell to explode or to burst because too much is rushing in. So we have, for example, maybe too much water rushing into the cell. When it bursts, that's often referred to as lysing. So that cell lysed. It burst. Hypertonic solutions is where it pulls things like water out of the cell. And so here you see that cell shriveling up. Maybe it was put into a concentration of salt and it's pulling that water out because there's more salt ions on the outside. So it's pulling the water out to that salt. In that case, it's going to cause that cell to shrivel up. And that shriveling that you see there is referred to as crenating or crenation. That's when it shrivels up. So cells in solution are going to have what's referred to as a tonicity. This is relative concentration of solutes outside of the cell to inside of the cell. And we just looked at those. They could be hypertonic, hypotonic, or isotonic. Another example of osmosis in action is that you can see the celery stick. When the celery stick is placed in distilled water, it causes that water to rush in because it's pure water. It doesn't have ions in it, so it comes on in. And it actually is going to cause that um, celery stick to stand straight up. It's got plenty of water in it. It becomes crisp. But if you place that celery stick in salt water, it's going to be a hypertonic solution. It's going to cause the water within that celery to rush out and actually cause it to bend over or wither. How do laxatives relieve constipation? We have things such as milk of magnesia or magnesium salts. And then with these, you're going to have water moving out through osmosis from those cells into the intestines. When they move into the intestines, it's going to actually help to moisten that fecal matter and help move it along and help get it out of the body. Usually with constipation, it's soaked up or taken out too much water from the fecal matter. And so it becomes kind of lodged or stuck in the intestines. So here you're going to put in where extra water can move into the intestines and help move it along. So the direction of osmosis is going to be determined by difference in total concentration of the molecules dissolved in the water. It does not matter what solutes they are. So in summary, the diffusion of water across the membrane is going to be a special type of passive transport called osmosis. Water moves from an area of lower concentration of solutes to an area with a higher concentration of solutes. Water molecules move across the membrane until the concentration of water inside and outside is equal. Remember, that's your isotonic. In active transport, cells are going to use energy to move small molecules into and out of the cell. Now, with active, active is always going to require energy. 
So molecules can't always move spontaneously or effortlessly in and out of cells. You're going to need your ATP. There's two distinct types of active transport. You're going to have primary and secondary, and they're only going to differ in their source of fuel that they use. So primary active transport uses energy directly from ATP. So it's going to occur when the movement of molecules into and out of the cell requires the input of energy. So you see that energy or ATP at the protein that's helping to bring them in or push them out. And so the ATP is going to attach and acts as like a pump. Here you see it pumping hydrogens in or out of the cell. Secondary transport is going to be transport of protein simultaneously as they move one molecule against the concentration gradient while letting another flow down its concentration gradient. Does not require ATP is used directly in this process. So with that secondary active transport, it's an indirect method. Many transporter proteins are going to use for fueling their activities. With this, the transport protein simultaneously moves those molecules, like we said, against the concentration gradient, but allows another to flow down its concentration gradient. So that's how it's going to help it. This one doesn't use ATP directly. At some point, though, in some other location, ATP was used to pump one of these types of molecules involved against their concentration gradient, but not directly. So we still have the use of ATP. So an active transport moving molecules across a membrane does require energy. Active transport's necessary if the molecule can be moved, are going to be very large, or if they're being moved against their concentration gradient. So let's say we already had a high amount inside of the cell, but we need more. So we're moving it against its gradient. Proteins embedded within the plasma membrane are gonna act like motorized revolving doors to actively transport these molecules across. Here's where we'll pick up with our next section. I will see you next time.